uh, today Oleg is going to be presenting. Oleg is CTO at Kubler, and you can reach out to him at on Twitter at OLGCH. Today's topic is container runtimes and tooling. Before we get started, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. We have a channel on slack.kubernetes.io. That's hashtag meetup-dc. So you can find us there um, for topics and discussion. Or if you want to present, let us know. We're available on Slack. Um, we also have a community page on community.cncf.io slash Washington-DC. Um, you can find the past events, recordings, and other material there. You can also sign up for events on the community page um, to get notifications for any future announcements. And we also have a YouTube channel where we upload all the recordings, so you can watch these later. Um, and a quick announcement that Kubernetes Community Days DC uh, has been scheduled for September 15th. That's going to be Thursday later this year. It's going to be an in-person event um, at the Red Cross DC. So we will have more details as, um, you know, we have, uh, um, as you know, as we work through the, the some of the stuff there. So look forward um, for that. We will have, you know, uh, we will ask for proposals and presentations later. Um, and let me know if you want to help out or connect and present on that event as well. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to um, Oleg to get us started. Oleg? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. And yeah, sharing my screen. Um, let me turn it off so it's not uh, distracting. And um, so, yes, thank you for the introduction. And today's topic is uh, container runtimes and tooling. Uh, just uh, uh, him already introduced me, so I won't uh, hang here for a long time. Just we'll talk a a minute about uh, what uh, I'm doing and what we are doing at uh, our company called Kubler. Uh, so it's Kubler is essentially a uh, tool that allows you to manage Kubernetes clusters, uh, create, provision, and manage Kubernetes clusters across different clouds, environments, uh, to make sure that you can centrally uh, monitor, collect logs, uh, audit them, so essentially to provide a very short time to market for enterprise Kubernetes implementations. And uh, so uh, working in this area, <clears throat> it's uh, um, what we see is that uh, very often uh, our customers benefit not only from the product, but also from uh, uh, the fact that we can guide them through uh, this uh, relatively new cloud native landscape and help them learn essentially what, which tools for uh, which needs they can use. And uh, essentially, uh, so how it happens in real life, uh, probably half of our job is to, to, to help to help our clients to essentially learn uh, the technology, the stack, and uh, which is why we often uh, do these kinds of presentations and uh, that that touch essentially basics uh, of, of various aspects and facets of, of this technology stack. And um, um, container runtimes and uh, container management in general, and tools used to manage containers, manage images, et cetera, et cetera. It's, well, absolutely from the fundamental part of this uh, cloud native stacks. Uh, and uh, when, 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 when I got this idea to, to talk about this, uh, uh, it seemed like it's, it is going to be something uh, easy to present uh, because, uh, we sort of work with it since uh, inception of this technology, since uh, Docker was released in 2013, and you think you know everything. And then suddenly it appears that uh, while you know uh, 
many tools used in this area uh, over time uh, whole building was built essentially around these tools uh, a, a mesh of various tools interrelated and interconnected and working together in different scenarios and different use cases so it was fun to to sort of make a step back and look at this whole structure uh, from afar a little bit <clears throat> so this presentation is uh, is actually showing uh, maybe not comprehensive view of these tools uh, because there are many more tools that are beyond this presentation but at least uh, most important interrelations and interconnections between <coughs> uh, different aspects of con content management and I want to start with a little bit of history uh, because uh, uh, maybe important to understand how this uh, whole building was uh, was growing over time uh, mainly because <coughs> uh, this concept of container management even though containers uh, uh, were there even before docker was released as an open source <coughs> uh, lxc technologies technology uh, essentially introduced linux containers uh, c groups and uh, uh, namespaces were introduced in linux uh, long before uh, Docker was released, they weren't as popular uh, or they weren't, let's call it practical uh, at that time. Uh, but when Docker released uh, an, an open source tool, first, uh, one of the, uh, first public release of open source Docker in March 2013, this whole thing changed because Docker provided a relatively comprehensive set of tools to work with containers practically and most importantly it provided developers with tools to uh, to work on that which is why docker still plays huge role in this whole ecosystem uh, so i won't go through every step here so you may want to go back to this slide after we go through this presentation maybe to review different steps uh, but uh, most important and critical technologies in this uh, cloud uh, Kubernetes, oh, sorry, uh, container management and container orchestration stack were introduced uh, or uh, by Docker uh, or uh, by collaborations where Docker <coughs> uh, participated. Uh, not all of them, of course, uh, <coughs> but, but a lot. The, the, um, the effect was very critical and this this essentially uh, shapes a little bit how how those standards are uh, created uh, or, or this architecture behind containers today so main components of this like landscape and we'll go through them one by one are well we'll uh, we'll, we'll here in this slide we will switch to sort of engineering or architecture view of these technologies because they didn't uh, come up in this order. Essentially, first implementation came up, like Docker, for example. Only then, uh, some aspects of these implementations uh, implementation were open sourced and standardized and became open, uh, open standards and specifications. <coughs> uh, again, uh, you may go back to uh, the history slide later if you want and see how it all evolved <clears throat> uh, but today uh, essentially the foundation of uh, this container management landscape is uh, OCI open container initiative specifications and most important or actually all uh, specifications it includes now uh, are three image uh, specification runtime specification and uh, distribution specification so uh, uh, on top of that we have various container runtimes and engines and uh, this is quite fuzzy uh, distinction between runtimes and agents uh, engines and uh, we'll talk about that uh, when we'll uh, talk about docker architecture and docker components now on top of that or after 
uh, uh, runtimes, container runtimes uh, uh, were introduced and standardized. <coughs> we have uh, container orchestration tools, and of course, Kubernetes is de facto uh, uh, main container orchestration tool of our day. And uh, as a result, uh, CRI, container runtime interface, um, uh, essentially a standard API used to integrate uh, Kubernetes and potentially other uh, container orchestrators uh, with container runtimes. And on top of that, we have a bunch of uh, tools, uh, some of them sort of inherited and uh, uh, having a uh, huge legacy like Docker, others newer, uh, even others uh, built for various purposes. So we'll uh, scan through several categories of these tools. So let's start with uh, specification. So Open Container Initiative, uh, as I said, con consists of, a, uh, of three uh, main specifications. Uh, uh, image spec, uh, image specification defines a format for container images. So container image is essentially a <clears throat> uh, snapshot of a file system, uh, root file system in which container should start, plus uh, some uh, additional uh, meta information points like uh, default ports that this container exposes, uh, default endpoint, so I mean process that needs to be started in this container and uh, arguments that are given to that uh, comment when the process is started uh, and uh, a few others like that. So essentially, uh, physically, uh, uh, this OCI image is just a targz archive or plain tar archive. Uh, uh, which includes uh, a couple of manifest files, JSON files, that in turn uh, refer to so contain this uh, metadata and refer to layer files. So layer files <coughs> are also included in the same uh, tar uh, image tar archive, uh, and they are by themselves. Uh, tar archives as well, including uh, their own manifests and uh, sets of files. And uh, image can contain multiple layers, it can contain single layer um, layers. Each layer may include just a few files, one file or many files. And essentially when this image is used, uh, when we start a container, what happens, those layers are placed on top of each other and uh, OCI image specification describes uh, in particular uh, so how uh, those layers are merged because it's easy to merge when you add files and uh, overwrite files like uh, some next layer contains some of the files in, in the underlying layers uh, with the same name but different content for example. Uh, but it also describes how you can mask files, like top layer can uh, remove sort of files that were introduced on the lower layer. Other than that, there, there is nothing uh, uh, magic about this OCI image spec, just a standard on packaging <coughs> uh, rootfs for container, uh, for container images plus some container image meta information. Uh, the second important uh, OCI spec is runtime specification, which uh, standardizes and defines uh, container uh, configuration and lifecycle. So container configuration is again a, a, just a JSON file, uh, which includes um, first and foremost uh, the image reference, so the image out of which this container is created. Uh, references to locations of uh, uh, top runtime image for this container and uh, a bunch of other uh, meta information like uh, which directories need to be mapped 
uh, for that container when it runs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, another thing that uh, OCI runtime spec uh, provides is a container lifecycle. So essentially, uh, what stages the container goes through when it is created. Uh, and here you can see two views of this uh, container lifecycle. The first one, so is essentially the, the phases and uh, hooks uh, that container runtime can use. So, uh, and container can use, uh, essentially container is first created uh, and it's just a representation of this container in the local file system. Uh, it's um, an image reference uh, plus top a directory which contains top layer of the <coughs> root file system. Then it gets started, in which case you have a process actually running for that container. Uh, before start, pre-start hook can be called, and uh, this is where often container runtime initializes a network uh, stack, etc., etc. Uh, then you can stop container, restart it again, uh, or delete it. And another view uh, essentially describes uh, different ter uh, terms used when you talk about containers. So we start with an image. Uh, then when we talk about container, we often talk about container which is just created but not actually running. But, and when container is actually running, we are talking about uh, process running within that container. Now, Docker and Container D <coughs> is uh, the oldest, uh, as we talked about that already, uh, container uh, runtime implementation. Um, so Docker went through several stages, and uh, this architecture uh, is uh, essentially what it came to over time. So initially, Docker was more or less monolithic uh, tool that provided uh, container management uh, and uh, image management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at some point, uh, uh, it separated uh, so-called uh, runtime components. And most importantly, uh, uh, so most basic and uh, baseline component is so-called lib container, which when uh, OCI was uh, uh, when OCI uh, was um, created, essentially, uh, Open Container Initiative was created. So essentially, lib container became uh, a part of OCI. It's a reference implementation of OCI standard, uh, as well as run C, so called run C. So, what's uh, lib container and run C? Lib container is, uh, is it? Uh, uh, as you can see from this, the name is a library essentially, so which allows you to manage processes inside containers. So if you, if you write, uh, it's a Go code library, um, so you can include it in your C or Go or any other uh, software uh, and use it to create containers from 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 your software. Uh, run C uses lib container and it's a reference command line tool to essentially start and manage containers locally. Uh, and again, as I said, they are both a part of OCI, run, uh, OCI runtime specification. They are both are uh, at the same time reference implementations and upstream container management implementations for many container management tools. So next layer is uh, container D. Actually, while run C is a command line tool, you can use run C from your command line to start a container. You cannot use it to, for example, uh, uh, pull or push image or um, uh, do some higher level operations uh, with it. You cannot list containers with run C because run C is a tool to run a single specific container. So container D provides all those higher level uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, it 
was also open sourced at some point by Docker and became a separate project. So it became a part of every Docker uh, package out there. So essentially when we are today, when we are talking about Docker, we really are talking about uh, Docker wrapper, which uses container D under the hood. So container D is uh, a package uh, which itself includes a service in, 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 in on, on different Linux operating systems. It uh, installs a service which uh, monitors different containers and provides essentially an API for a certain command line tool uh, to manage those containers and images, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Mobi is another open source project uh, that was open sourced by Docker. And this is where it becomes uh, a bit confusing, really, because is, is Mobi, for example, different from Docker CE? Docker CE? Uh, in fact, it is, sort of. Uh, and is, is Mobi different from Container D? It's definitely different, but <clears throat> so essentially, when we are talking about Mobi, uh, Mobi can be set up separately, uh, installed separately on your system, and some uh, some distributions include Mobi instead of Docker <coughs> in their repository. And Mobi essentially provides the same functionality as Docker CE. Now, uh, relation between Mobi and Docker CE is similar to uh, former relation between uh, Fedora and uh, CentOS, for example. So Fedora is a uh, R&D open source or was R&D open source uh, uh, quickly uh, developed version of uh, CentOS and Red Hat. And the same uh, purpose, uh, um, so Mobi has the same purpose. So it's an open source R&D uh, development project which Docker and open source community use as upstream for Docker CE and other tools. And now on top of that, we have Docker CE or Docker EE, Docker Enterprise Edition, or Docker Desktop, so a number of commercial tools that Docker releases. Um, another container implementation is Cryo. So Cryo uh, appeared uh, a bit later. Uh, <clears throat> it was de developed by Red Hat, and it was developed uh, after Kubernetes was released, actually, and after Kubernetes introduced this common uh, uh, CRI API for integration between uh, Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, so Cryo was uh, essentially born and developed as a clean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, as a clean OCI and CRI implementation. So it's very modular, it's open source, it's, it's nice, it's clean. Uh, unfortunately, it's much less uh, popular, uh, probably a bit less uh, prevalent than uh, Container D and Docker. So it's used definitely in CentOS, uh, our latest versions of Red Hat and CentOS, and it's used in OpenShift by default and in a few other container uh, Kubernetes implementations, uh, but becomes also uh, more and more popular over time. Uh, apologies. Uh, yeah, and I see Peter, thank you for sending the link. I'll try to watch the chat also for the questions. So if you have questions uh, on the way, please uh, put them in the chat. I'll try to respond on the way. So let's see. Now, uh, as we covered uh, container runtimes, and uh, by the way, so uh, container D, Docker, Cryo, uh, definitely not the only container runtimes out there. There are a few more. Um, some uh, have similar nature, so they just provide <clears throat> uh, container management for standard uh, container runtimes. Uh, 
of for standard Linux containers. Others uh, may be uh, may provide, uh, for example, CRI uh, API for uh, quote unquote containers of different nature, like virtual machines posing as containers. So uh, this is a very interesting topic. Unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have much time in this presentation. I don't want to cover it, but uh, just just for you to know that there is this uh, possibility. So uh, uh, container runtime can be actually pretty much anything uh, under, under uh, CRI API, for example. Um, now, as we talked about container runtimes, <coughs> uh, uh, the next logical step, which uh, and the next layer on top of container runtimes is uh, container orchestration tools and Kubernetes in particular. So, in Kubernetes, uh, again, uh, we can go back to the history slide. Uh, initially, uh, was working with uh, with Docker only. Uh, in the first versions, uh, but over time, uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, community uh, decided to separate um, uh, container orchestration and actual container management. And uh, this is when uh, CRI was born, uh, container runtime interface. So and the first uh, implementation of CRI was essentially internal <coughs> API inside uh, Kubernetes code, <coughs> which was implemented by a component called Docker Shin. So, and uh, you might have heard this name when you uh, when you read about uh, when you read announcements about uh, Kubernetes deprecating uh, Docker support. And uh, sometimes it sounds like Kubernetes deprecates Docker Shin. So essentially, Docker Shim is, is a part of Kubernetes code inside Kubernetes, which uh, essentially an adapter that uh, exposes uh, external Docker, uh, Docker socket API to uh, Kublet uh, as a CRI um, API. This is still supported in, in, in Kubernetes in at least in the version 122. I think they are removing it in 123. <coughs> um, now over time, uh, as container D was separated from uh, Docker and uh, standardization were essentially uh, um, in progress, um, uh, Kubernetes introduced another adapter called CRI container D internal piece, uh, internal component again, uh, which uh, again exposed uh, CRI to Kublet, uh, but uh, worked with uh, container D instead of Docker. And you remember that container D in more or less modern Docker uh, versions is under the hood. <coughs> so uh, this is why this picture is shown like that. Uh, and again, over time, uh, this uh, component was removed from Kubernetes and instead uh, a CRI plugin became a standard part of container D. So essentially now when you install a container D, uh, there is a CRI plugin inside so that container D exposes CRI API directly and Kubernetes can talk to container D directly. So this is more or less modern uh, architecture, modern setup for Kubernetes, which uses uh, uh, container D. <clears throat> and it's exactly the same as with Cryo, because Cryo, as you remember, is a clean implementation of uh, OCI and CRI. So by definition, it exposes CRI interface, which Kubernetes can use. Uh, now, just uh, for that, not to be just a lecture, uh, I can show you how in practice uh, working with different Kubernetes runtimes and tool sets look like. And uh, we'll also scan through a few other tools that can be used uh, to work with containers. Uh, but before uh, going there, 
So let me explain what I have here in terms of demo setup. So um, I created a simple cluster that I would Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and I don't really need Kubernetes cluster per se. Uh, what I wanted to have with that Kubernetes cluster is to have uh, two different nodes where Docker and uh, container D are set up as the main uh, container runtimes. And uh, for me, it was easier to just create a cluster. Uh, <clears throat> this cluster is pretty much standard cluster with a single master and a single worker node. Uh, Kubler by default creates this cluster with a Docker runtime. So uh, we have master node configured with Docker. Uh, and for worker nodes, I uh, told Kubler uh, that it should configure it with container D instead of Docker. Uh, and uh, that's how I will, uh, I will be able to show you how you can work with Docker and container D directly. Uh, and as a side effect of this, uh, you can see now that for Kubernetes, it's not really very important which uh, container runtime you are using as long as uh, it supports CRI. Uh, you can even run different container runtimes on different nodes in your cluster, which may be very useful, uh, for example, if you are <coughs> uh, using some complex architectures like uh, Kubernetes clusters where you have uh, worker nodes with uh, GPU. So GPU to, to, to provide access to NVIDIA GPU, for example, NVIDIA provides a special modified uh, uh, Docker runtime. So a variant of RunC that uh, passes through um, NVIDIA devices and allows containers, container pro containerized processes to use them. So uh, if you want to use your NVIDIA hardware in your Kubernetes cluster, you would have to configure uh, uh, container runtime a little bit differently on those nodes where you have uh, GPU nodes. And it's very good that Kubernetes doesn't really care whether you, you may have, for example, uh, cryo on master nodes <coughs> because it's most stable and clean, for example, uh, and you may have uh, Docker with NVIDIA modification uh, on your NVIDIA worker group. Uh, and then you may have a uh, standard container D on some other uh, node group because the operating system you are using there, for example, only supports container D. Just, just imagine things. <coughs> okay, now uh, going to our command line. So uh, I configured it here. I can check that we do have access to this uh, uh, to this cluster. Uh, I can run. I'm using a uh, kubectl plugin uh, called Node Shell to actually gain access to uh, the node. So what Node Shell does? Uh, it's uh, essentially starts a uh, container we, uh, on, on, on a specified node, which uh, goes out of uh, the containerized jail, which is why it's called in the center, uh, and allows you to sort of SSH into the node, which may be very useful uh, from time to time. Now let me go to, so this is my master where I have Docker configured as a runtime. And uh, this is my worker node, where I have uh, um, I have a container D configured. So uh, when we are talking about uh, Docker tools, so Docker is probably the most comprehensive of all the tools uh, we are going to talk about today. So it includes, uh, and for a good reason, because it, 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 it was the first essentially on the market and it's a single so sort of huge uh, 
monolith of uh, container and image management tools. <coughs> With Docker, uh, let's see how many subcommands it includes, and some of them are sort of uh, are duplicating, like RM, for example, uh, is a remove container command, RMI is a remove image command, uh, and they uh, it's it's a good practice to instead use subcommand of a corresponding uh, uh, top level command, like instead of Docker RM, use Docker container RM, uh, containers RM, and instead of Docker RMI, you should use Docker images RM, <coughs> uh, clearly specifying what object you are working with in context of Docker. Uh, so with uh, these Docker commands, you can build images, for example, and uh, this is a uh, very important functionality. This is why Docker became so important step in container uh, adoption, because it made it very easy for developers to, to create new container images. So uh, Docker image build uses a Docker file, so-called uh, Docker file, which essentially defines uh, image layers through a set of commands. So the first command is usually from, and then you give an image name, which will become base image for this uh, image you are building. There may be add commands that include new files uh, from your local file system into the image you are building. There may be run commands, which run certain command uh, inside of the image uh, you are building and uh, modify it. And each of these commands create a new image layer. <coughs> and in the end, you provide a set of commands that define all required metadata and voila you have a new image so with uh, a docker image build uh, dash dash tag uh, parameter uh, you are telling docker that i want to use my docker file in current directory and as a result of this docker file uh, a new image will be built which will be tagged as my image vz10 uh, you can check images that you have locally uh, and here I don't have really anything which is strange. <coughs> Let me see. Here I, I only have container D, uh, which is why a, a Docker doesn't work here. But let's 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 just do uh, yep, one of the images. So I can <coughs> uh, download an image uh, using pull command, and as you can see, uh, by default, so I, uh, I I gave a very minimalistic command uh, Docker pull Ubuntu. So uh, here, Docker uses a number of defaults. Uh, first of all, it uh, knows that if I'm not specifying a so-called repository, uh, it will get a default library repository where Docker as a company actually hosts a number of commonly used standard images. Uh, it will, uh, because I didn't specify a, a Docker image repository, by default, it will use Docker Hub. And you can see here docker.io uh, the common uh, open repository, public repository of standard images. And not only standard images, you can create an account there and store your images there. And it uses tag latest, so which is again a standard tag for the latest version of your image. And now, uh, Sorry, I'm probably missing something about, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, Docker images actually lists uh, all the images available on your machine. And as you can see here, uh, this just uh, recently pulled image that I have just pulled uh, is here at the top of the list. <coughs> Other images are once used by Kubernetes on this node. 
uh, after you build your own image, you can tag it and uh, re-tag it. So you, you may have multiple images tagged with, uh, or the same image tagged by multiple tags. And tag also specifies where this image should be placed. So when you do push of this image, in this case, it will be pushed into this uh, imaginary myrepa.com re re registry. Uh, also, you have a bunch of commands on Docker that allow you to run uh, those containers. Uh, and a uh, very simplistic command that I can run here is so I'm telling Docker that I want to run a container using this Ubuntu image, which I have just downloaded. And I ask it to run a command or process with echo binary parameter high. That's exactly the result we would expect. So it did create a container, it ran it, and uh, the process stopped. So container is now stopped. Um, so this is uh, the most important capabilities of uh, Docker toolset, but of course there are a bunch of more, a bunch of others. You can export images into files, import images from files. You can suspend, resume uh, container execution. Uh, you can manage uh, volumes, uh, networks. Uh, so all of that is part of this Docker command line toolset. Uh, so on the con side, it's it's a bit on the heavier side of things. So Docker, uh, first of all, it relies on a container D, which is itself a service running on your machine, on your server. And Docker uh, is itself a daemon service. Uh, so you rely on two services running without issues when you work with Docker. Uh, so uh, that's uh, how Docker uh, toolset looks like. Uh, Container D, as I said, is a little bit on more uh, basic side. And uh, here, uh, uh, standard Container D tool, uh, command line tool is called CTR. And with CTR, you can again, use my other machine. I'll give this command called uh, CTR NS LS. Uh, what I did here, I asked uh, uh, this container D to tell me the, which namespaces it has. And by the way, you know that uh, Docker runs container D under the hood. So here we should be able to run CTR tool as well. Let's do that. And indeed, we can run CTR tool here, but we see a different namespace here. So uh, as you can probably guess already, uh, here Kubernetes talks to Docker and Docker uses container D to run containers. And Docker does it in a container D namespace called Mobi by default. Uh, when Kubernetes works with uh, container D directly, uh, Kubernetes creates its own namespace called kubernetes.io. And uh, this is how you can tell the difference uh, if you are just asking uh, container D. They can see a few questions, by the way, in the chat. Would you run this command on one of your containers? Docker inspect, config uh, username. Interesting. I don't know what, what, what will it print. So when you uh, do uh, so it would it, it, it should give uh, out usernames of those containers running inside of uh, I mean current usernames uh, used by the processes by the root processes running in those containers if I am not mistaken there are a lot of containers probably there is a syntax error I don't really remember how correctly uh, how to correctly run it but you are right uh, 
uh, in many cases you don't want to uh, so it's a good practice to make sure that your containers are configured in such a way that processes inside uh, run as uh, non-root processes um, okay let's get back here so uh, when it comes to uh, worker working with images it's it's very similar to how we did that with docker so it also has a subcommand images so you can pull and push images so it can work with registries uh remove images uh, loaded locally unlike docker it has a nice uh, function called mount and mount image so you can actually mount image uh, in, in some point in, in your file system and inspect files there which which may be useful from time to time uh, docker as far as i remember doesn't have this comment directly unless i'm very mistaken so uh, uh another uh, um, set of comments are of course related to container management so uh uh, just again note how uh, it's a little bit more basic than what docker does when 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 you are working with docker you are only dealing with containers now container d uh, deals with two types of objects here so first of all it's container <clears throat> and container it's uh, is a kind of uh, prepared uh, container for your processes so it's not running uh, itself when when we are in context of container d so when you create a container it's not yet running it's just uh, uh, essentially allocates a directory where container uh, rootfs um, will be uh, mapped uh, and to start that container you need to create a task object so uh, as it's shown here uh, when you create a new task in that container you actually get a process process running in that container uh, and you can create multiple tasks uh, in your container um, and when all the tasks are complete well you can remove your container so which, which is probably why it's called container so uh, there is another uh, tool that makes uh, managing uh, container d containers uh, a little bit easier called nerd ctl uh, you can look it up so it, it tries to mimic uh, docker a little bit more <coughs> uh, so it makes it a little bit more convenient although uh, the mapping is not exact it's not one to one so uh, if you compare it to docker uh, you will see that there are uh, a few pros that it has like it has multiple namespaces you can label every object out there you can mount images and uh, container d also supports a notion of content uh, which was introduced by oci but not supported by docker so essentially it allow, allows you to store uh, any type of content in in container registries but on the con side it doesn't have image build tools like docker uh, and uh, it doesn't consider docker hub a default storage for your container uh, for your images so you have to always use full name for your images so podman uh, tries to solve some of these problems so podman is another open source tool that again uh, tries to make it possible for you when you migrate to container d to mimic docker essentially as much as possible so pretty much every command you can run with docker you can run with podman as well and uh, you can also build images using uh, docker files uh, or if you want to stay portable and use portable names you can rename them to container file uh, but essentially podman is very similar to docker and uh, uh, it, 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 it is not a standalone tool uh, or it, it is a standalone tool it, it just relies <coughs> for build functionality it relies on a tool called builder or builder uh, and essentially builder is a, a separate tool that allows you to build images to manage images it focuses on image management 
So you can also use Builder uh, when you have container D uh, to build images from a container file or Docker file, <coughs> or you can pretty much essentially construct your image uh, using container uh, file commands one by one from command line using builder uh, com builder sub commands so uh, benefits of uh, builder and uh, podman are, are that relative to docker uh, is that they they don't rely on any demons they are standalone tools that work with container directly unlike docker which 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 requires this docker daemon and another uh, tool that I want to mention, and uh, uh, not as a separate tool that uh, would help you build containers, but as an approach, essentially. So, and uh, uh, often uh, Basil uh, is a build general purpose build tool that allows you to create a hermetic build systems. So, essentially, systems where uh, it's a build system that allows you to build your project in a uh, manner that it doesn't depend on environment. And uh, it has a set of rules. Uh, so Basil relies on a concept of rules, pluggable rules that you can define yourself so uh, or use existing ones. So it has a set of rules for working with Docker containers that allow you to <coughs> manage uh, essentially, not Docker images uh, in, in in the Basil manner. Essentially, you can define your external uh, dependencies, uh, base container, base images uh, in your workspace Basil file, uh, specifying exact digests and tags uh, to make sure that it's exactly the same uh, base image. Uh, all the time then you define your build process which essentially which is essentially a set of goals that rely on each other and uh, at some point when you have your service binary built uh, here it's designated as a svc goal uh, you can build a tar uh, of your files that you can include as a layer into your container image and uh, or you can put multiple layers you can include separate uh, separate files there and as a result you will get exactly same image uh, if you give it exactly same source files this is uh, a big deal really for uh, uh, for build efficiency especially in very large monorepo projects although this is not a specialized uh, docker image building tool I, I i just wanted to point at uh, this special category of build tools which may be important for larger projects so just a summary view of those tools we looked through uh, uh, that probably help uh, get an impression of how uh, those tools uh, <coughs> relate to each other and what they are focusing on <coughs> so hopefully it, it is helpful uh, i also included in this presentation and will publish it uh, a bunch of links to the projects mentioned and the tools mentioned and some some of the blogs uh, that give a very good summary uh, of um, the space and i will just so i hope this is helpful i think now we are open to questions if there are any Awesome. Thank you so much, Oleg. Um, I don't see any uh, big questions. There was some, uh, uh, Peter was saying that we should, the friends don't let friends uh, run containers as root. Yeah, and that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a good comment. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's just the easiest way to log in on this machine, here, right? <laughs> yes. yes. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, thank you so much. Um, there is actually a question. Um, Laurent is asking, were there, were there any high-level security concerns addressed by the evolution and runtimes? Or is this related? Uh, very good point. Very good point. Actually, somewhere on the way, <clears throat> and this is uh, how some of the uh, runtimes uh, we talked about, and some of the runtimes 
uh, we didn't talk about. Uh, so how they differentiate. So for example, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, another feature of Cryo is ability to uh, to uh, control uh, which we um, which kernel calls are allowed and uh, which are not, uh, or at least uh, would defaults. Docker actually and Container D can do that as well. Uh, they uh, most of those container uh, runtimes uh, support various security technologies in uh, uh, in Linux like C Linux, uh, SE Linux, uh, uh, C Comp uh, sets, etc., uh, etc. Et so yes, uh, so a number of uh, security technologies were supported over time in, in, in most of modern uh, container runtimes. Which tool would you recommend to determine which packages were run executed? As you know, the images are bloated and not everything runs. Huh. This is a, an interesting question. So, well, uh, I think uh, I think here we go into the area of uh, uh, modern tracing tools. Maybe uh, eBPF would help. A lot here. I think just uh, a couple of sessions ago we had a session where uh, for him, do you remember? Uh, we talked yeah, about Trivi. The where there was yeah. Trivi, which scans all of the images. Then there is Falco, which gives mm -hmm. some runtime intelligence into what is running, what kind of system calls are being passed. Uh, being passed. Um, the other tools, I think uh, it's harder to say like which tool gives you exactly what is being touched more like what system calls are being executed falco can give you that list uh yeah. source tool from sysdig and then also yeah please yeah encore somebody's sharing something from encore as bomb of containers so i think uh, a better approach would be to uh, construct your images uh so that they don't have any uh, extra files and and basil uh, would be a great tool to look at uh, if you uh, if you are looking at this uh, approach again because here you you are literally uh, constructing assembling this image file one, one file after the other but of course you can do that in uh, using any other tool like if you if you work with builder or even docker uh, uh, docker files and docker you can say from scratch meaning that your first layer just doesn't contain any files and then you would add only those files you need in that image right there's a good good tool that is recommended by peter is sif mm -hmm. if you want to look through the list of all the um, packages and two but that's like the fundamental baseline like oleg said is that have the container as smallest as possible. Um, all right, I think we are four minutes over. Thank you everybody for joining. This was um, really helpful. I really uh, enjoyed and learned a few bits as well. Uh, hope, to, hope to see you guys in a couple of weeks. We have one talk uh, potentially from Portainer coming up and then another one from Cockroach uh, as well. So look forward to those invites and um, see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. See you.